In the world of speedrunning, every game has a story. Even the most obscure titles have a chance to blossom into an amazing speedrun with a lot of depth. Some of the richest stories in speedrunning can be found within these obscure games, and the Crash Bandicoot series is home to one such game. A diamond in the rough that comparatively few know about, and yet a game with one of the deepest, most interesting speedrun stories just waiting to be told. This is the story of speedrunning's hidden gem. This is the story of Crash Twin Sanity. Before we get started, what is Crash Twin Sanity? Crash Twin Sanity is the fifth mainline game in the Crash Bandicoot series, released in 2004 for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox. The game is a direct sequel to the previous mainline entry, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex, and is a pretty noticeable departure from the four games that preceded it. Twin Sanity puts a heavy emphasis on Crash teaming up with the series' usual villain, Dr. Neo Cortex, and utilizes many gameplay styles that focus on the two working together. Additionally, instead of having a central hub of levels like the earlier game's warp rooms, Twin Sanity features a large, mostly open world for you to traverse through. The game still progresses in a linear fashion like its predecessors, but each area seamlessly transitions into the next one in a fashion similar to a game like Jack and Daxter. The game is divided into four hubs, with each hub containing the main central area and three additional areas that serve as the game's levels. Progressing through one level unlocks the next level in the chain, either by directly dropping you off there or providing access to an area previously inaccessible, and the goal of the game is to defeat the antagonists, the evil twins, at the end of the final level, Antagony. What Twin Sanity is most infamous for, however, is its extremely troubled development. There are tons of ideas and concepts that never made it into the game proper, all of which have been extensively documented through interviews with the developers as well as concept art and audio samples that they have published online. To go over all of this would probably take up several videos alone, but the most important thing is this. Twin Sanity is very unfinished, and very broken. While the game is largely stable, albeit short, when played casually, it became very quickly apparent just how much you could break it if you were trying. These requirements to beat the game were nothing more than guidelines, and speedrunners would push the game much further than anyone imagined. The earliest pieces of Crash Twin Sanity speedrunning date back to May of 2011, in the form of several skips found by renowned Finnish speedrunner Samurai Man. Two of these skips were found in the game's very first hub, Insanity Island. After completing the second level, Cavern Catastrophe, you are placed in a new section of the main hub, in which there are only two ways to go. You can either take a short cave back to the first section of Insanity Island, or you can continue up a hill to the game's third level, Totem Hokum, a very long level containing an escort mission, a stealth section through the river, and an infiltration and escape through the native village. After this, a cave returns you to the central hub, but in an upper area previously inaccessible, where Cortex and a new character named Farmer Ernest wait for you. Samurai Man, however, found a way to skip Totem Hokum completely. By using this haystack right outside the entrance to the level, you can jump onto the tree right next to it, and from the tree, you can jump onto the rock formation separating you from the upper section of the hub. You can then skip a minigame where you have to use Cortex to kill some worms and just head straight up to the highest section of the hub, where the second skip comes into play. Right before the end of Insanity Island is the game's second boss, a totem god named Tikimon. The trigger for the cutscene that leads you into this fight is placed directly after the checkpoint that leads you into this arena, but said trigger doesn't extend very far vertically. With proper spacing and timing, Samurai Man was able to jump onto the rock on the right side of the archway and then quickly jump off of it and over the cutscene trigger. He then simply walked across the arena and away from Tikimon without ever triggering the boss fight. Once past the arena, the player can board the boat at the end of the island and proceed to the next hub. The next skip Samurai Man found is located all the way in the game's third hub, the Academy of Evil. This door contains the entrance to the hub's second level, Classroom Chaos, which remains shut until you beat the previous level, Boiler Room Doom. Samurai Man was able to find a way to get this door to open early though. By utilizing this tree and the arrow crates next to it, he was able to make it to the top of the academy, a location you can normally only reach after finishing the third level in the hub, Rooftop Rampage. However, the checkpoint located in this top area has a wide enough trigger range that you can activate it even through the invisible wall that's blocking you from actually standing on the roof. A simple death abuse will then allow you to respawn at that checkpoint. From here, Samurai Man begins to backtrack into Rooftop Rampage, body slamming on this shelf to go out of bounds and jumping over this part of the roof to avoid triggering a cutscene that would cause the game to crash in its current state. 
Samurai Man then enters the arena of the game's second-to-last boss, Madame Amberly. This boss arena is usually only accessible while playing as Cortex, and as such, the fight only works properly with him. Since the player at this point is playing as Crash in a spot where that isn't intended, triggering the fight in this state doesn't produce anything useful. However, upon entering the arena, the flags for the rest of the hub being unlocked are set, so once he sets foot in here, Samurai Man performs another death abuse. Upon respawning, he returns to the lower section of the hub, with the door to Classroom Chaos now open. Boiler Room Doom is a very long level, and itself contains a rather lengthy boss fight with recurring villain Dingo Dial, so even with this long, convoluted setup, it is still much faster to unlock Classroom Chaos this way than by proceeding through Boiler normally. Samurai Man's last major discovery during this time frame takes place in the game's final hub, Twin Sanity Island. In the main area of the hub, there exists a cliff with a cave entrance at the top that is normally inaccessible. The purpose of this cave is to allow you to backtrack to the main area from the start of the game's last level and agony. However, Samurai Man was able to make it to the top of the cliff using a ball from a nearby gem puzzle to gain enough vertical height to jump to the top. With this, he was able to go straight to Ant Agony, completely bypassing the second to last level Bandicoot Pursuit, another lengthy escort mission level in a similar vein to the beginning of Totem Hokum. Thanks to Samurai Man's efforts, three entire levels and two boss fights had already been eliminated from the route before runs had even been attempted. Even in its infancy, Crash Twin Sanity was looking like a very promising speedrun. The oldest known Twin Sanity speedrun with video evidence is dated August 24th, 2012, and was performed by a runner named Singe. Very early into the first level, Jungle Bungle, he makes use of another glitch called the Long Jump. Crash's slide jump in Twin Sanity doesn't function the way it does in previous games, and has more similarities to a game like Super Mario 64. And for some reason, if, after doing a slide jump, your next jump is at a ledge, that jump will carry the momentum of the slide jump. This might be the single most important piece of tech in the entire Crash Twin Sanity speedrun. Not only does it allow for movement optimization by allowing you to cover distance quicker, it also makes countless jumps that aren't supposed to be possible, possible. Upon reaching the arena for the first boss fight with Cortex, Singe performs a death abuse. The game's cutscenes are unskippable, and a lot of the time save in Twin Sanity comes from knowing how to dodge the triggers for these cutscenes. The Cortex boss fight is preceded by a very long cutscene, but by touching the spikes on the edge of the arena and dying before the cutscene starts, the game skips it entirely and just immediately begins the fight upon respawning. Once the fight is beaten, the game immediately moves to the second level, Cavern Catastrophe. The first half of this level plays out very similarly to the Atlasphere levels from The Wrath of Cortex, with the player controlling Crash and Cortex at the same time while they tumble around in a ball beating the shit out of each other. The second half introduces you to the teamwork mechanics of playing as Crash and Cortex together. Outside of that though, there isn't too much to talk about with this level. After leaving Cavern Catastrophe, Singe is placed in the second half of Insanity Island, where he does both skips to bypass Totem Hokum and the Tikimon boss fight. From there, he boards the boat to the second hub, Iceberg Lab. After watching a very long cutscene at the beginning of the hub, he proceeds to the next level, Ice Climb. This level features several minor skips that are used to bypass most of the required platforming. First, Singe jumps onto this pylon in order to skip the entirety of the bottom floor. From there, he uses the momentum from bouncing off of a crate to land on an invisible surface surrounding this axle. He then jumps onto one of the rotating platforms from above the conveyor belt in order to skip the second floor. He repeats this again for the third floor, and just like that, he's already at the top of the room. Another cutscene plays, and the player is once again put in control of both Crash and Cortex. Singe uses a long jump to bypass the first puzzle that requires throwing Cortex over a large gap so he can activate a bridge for you to walk across. He then positions himself in a specific spot and throws Cortex right as one of the level's bats swoops in to attack him. Taking advantage of the invincibility frames provided after getting hit, Singe then rides the bat up to the top of the cliff, once again skipping a large amount of the level. He then throws Cortex to the other side of the chasm, using a long jump to follow him and avoid waiting for Cortex to raise some platforms. Once inside the cave, a boss fight with Uka Uka occurs. Singe quickly clears the fight, and from there finishes the level and continues to proceed towards the inside of the lab. Upon entering the lab, a forced mob fight with the game's primary enemies, the ants, begins. So Singe does the logical thing. He grabs Cortex and proceeds to walk out of the lab. What you're supposed to do is clear out all of the enemies in the lab, watch two very long cutscenes where Cortex explains he has a machine called the Psychotron that will take them to the evil twin's lair in the 10th dimension, and how they need two more crystals to power it, and then proceed from the lower floor of the lab to the next level. 
However, the checkpoint located on the lower floor is visible from the outside of the upper floor, and with proper positioning, you can actually throw Cortex so that he'll hit it and activate it. From there, a symbol death abuse will respawn the player at that checkpoint, thereby skipping the mob fight inside the lab and both of the cutscenes. The next two levels, Slipslide Ice Capades and High Seas Hijinks, play out pretty normally with no significant skits or glitches of note. Slipslide Ice Capades is an on-rails level akin to the Polar and Pura levels from Crash 2 and 3, except in this one you're using Cortex as a makeshift snowboard. High Seas Hijinks is standard platforming fare, but is also pretty notorious for being one of the longest and most grueling levels in the game. The first portion consists of you traversing through Engine's battleship in order to confront him in one of the most boring boss fights in the series. Immediately after, the player is sent into quite possibly the most infamous chase sequence in the entire franchise, in which Crash is forced to escape from the battleship's chef, Rusty Walrus. This sequence is notoriously difficult even casually. The treacherous layout, Rusty's ridiculous speed, and the fact that any movement Crash does requires total commitment makes this an absolutely brutal sequence to clear quickly. Even today, this chase sequence is one of the hardest parts of the game to do fast, so it's unsurprising to see how delicately Singe takes the sequence, doing nothing but basic running for the majority of it. Once out of the chase, the player is once again sent into another boss fight, this time with Entropy and Embryo. This fight is a complete auto-scroller with nothing to talk about, but once it's completed, Singe is returned to the Iceberg Lab, where he's able to now proceed to the next hub, Academy of Evil. Upon arriving at the Academy, Singe performs a significantly faster version of the Boiler Room Doom skip than the one found by Samurai Man. By body slamming onto this doorframe, he was able to go out of bounds and onto the roof. After walking along the edge of the roof for a bit, he eventually falls down right into the entrance for Classroom Chaos, much quicker than the old setup of opening the door by backtracking into the Madame Amberly boss fight. The first half of Classroom Chaos is a standard crash platforming level, but the second half has you switch to playing as Cortex by himself. Cortex is very slow compared to Crash, consisting of puzzle-based gameplay where you have to shoot at objects that will let him traverse through various hazards. He also has no fast movement tech, with his fastest option being his basic run. Fortunately, it's possible to bypass the trigger that switches you to Cortex and do the entire second half of the level as Crash. By body slamming on this door right before the trigger that causes the switch and going out of bounds, you're able to jump over the trigger. You can then traverse the rest of the level as Crash. Singe demonstrates this in his run, and it's immediately apparent just how much faster it is. The next level, Rooftop Rampage, is the one level where you play as Cortex's niece, Nina. Her gameplay consists mostly of running and grappling, and as such is pretty straightforward, with not much to talk about. The end of Rooftop Rampage brings the player to the arena where they fight Madame Amberly. Beating this fight is required to unlock the trigger that lets the player leave the Academy of Evil, so there's no way to skip it. However, there is an extremely easy cheese strat that makes Amberly attack the same organ pipe continuously. The way this strat is done is... standing in place. Like, actually, that's the strat. After effortlessly winning the fight, Singe returns to the outside of the Academy and takes the exit elevator out of the hub and back to the Iceberg Lab, where Cortex's machine takes the player to the final hub, Twin Sanity Island. This hub opens up with Rock Slide Rumble, another snowboarding level similar to Slip Slide Ice Capades. Outside of two unfortunate deaths and nitros towards the end of the level, there's not much to say about Singe's pass through it. Now in the central area of Twin Sanity Island, Singe performs the Bandicoot Pursuit skip to allow him to go directly to the game's final level, Ant Agony. This level is an absolute gauntlet, being over 7 minutes long and filled with tons of tricky platforming as well as mob fights and puzzles to solve in order to open gateways to the next parts of the level. Singe takes a pretty nasty death midway through the level that loses him a lot of time, but the rest of it goes smoothly and he proceeds to the final boss fight with the evil twins. This is a three-part boss fight, with the first phase of the fight played as Nina, using her grapple to destroy energy towers that are powering the twins' robot. After that, the second phase consists of Cortex destroying the robot's weapons with his blaster. The third and final phase sees Crash piloting the Mecha Bandicoot from the game's first boss fight, using it to finish the twins off and ending the game. Singe's final fight goes off without a hitch, and he achieves a final time of 1 hour, 4 minutes, and 39 seconds, setting the first known world record for Crash Twin Sanity. Here. Singe's run set a very good benchmark for moving forward, but this was only the beginning. There was so much more to be discovered with this game, and many more skits would be found in the time between Singe's run and the next known world record. On January 25th, 2013, speedrunner and glitch hunter Beta M uploaded a video of a trick that he called Mountain Skip. At the entrance to the tunnel that leads into Ice Climb, Beta instead uses a body slam to climb to the mountainside above the tunnel. Once up there, he slide jumps up the mountain to set up what's called an airwalk. 
If Crash initiates a slide jump and lands on an area that's higher up than his initial starting point, he'll maintain a regular run for a short time when he walks off a ledge. Twinsanity has a fail-safe system where if you fall for a certain amount of time, the game will automatically kill you and force a respawn. But because airwalking keeps Crash out of the falling state for a couple of seconds, it allows the player to descend from higher than intended without dying. With the airwalk now stored, Beta walks along the edge of the mountain. It should be noted that this edge is extremely thin, being no more than a few pixels wide, so walking along this is very difficult. Once at the other side of the mountain, Beta uses the airwalk to descend to a lower edge. After walking along that edge, he walks off and lands safely on a portion of the main hub that has a tunnel leading directly to High Seas Hijinks. This tunnel doesn't normally become accessible until you've visited High Seas Hijinks for the first time, and is intended to be a means to either backtrack to the central hub or return to the level at a later time without having to traverse through ice climb and slip slide ice capades. Later on, an easier setup for the mountain skip was found that uses a long jump in place of the airwalk, but regardless, Beta was able to access the tunnel early and go straight to High Seas Hijinks upon entering the Iceberg Lab, thus removing both ice climb and slip slide ice capades from the run. A few months later, on May 7th, 2013, Beta uploaded another run of a new trick called Warp Skip. At the start of Twin Sanity Island, it turns out that by holding down and mashing the jump button, the player is able to gain control of Crash before the cutscene that plays at the beginning of the hub starts. The player can then walk around the cutscene trigger, grab Cortex, and carry him to the outside of the lab. Once outside, the player can then cleverly use Cortex to scale the side of the lab before reaching the very top of it, using the giant N on the outside to store a long jump. The player can then use a long jump to clip through the walls and reach the inside of the top floor of the lab. This section of the lab isn't properly loaded in, so the player has to activate a specific door to have the room work properly. But once in this room, the player can take a portal that will teleport them directly to Ant Agony. This cut out the need to do Rock Slide Rumble and obsoleted the previous skip for Bandicoot Pursuit. However, it came with a very big catch. Because Cortex was used to reach the top of the lab, the game was now in a state of believing that you were playing as Crash and Cortex together. Whenever you die in Twin Sanity, the game will attempt to respawn you as whatever character combination it thinks you are, and if you're in a level where that specific combination isn't meant to exist, the game crashes. Ant Agony is a solo crash level up until the final fight with the Evil Twins, meaning that trying to respawn as Crash and Cortex will result in the game crashing. In other words, doing Warp Skip cuts out the entire rest of Twin Sanity Island, but with the caveat that you could not die a single time in Ant Agony. If you did, the game would crash and the run would be over. Warp Skip saved a lot of time, but also introduced a very big risk. Sometime afterwards, Beta achieved a new world record with a time of 56.25. This run was the first record to incorporate both Mountain Skip and Warp Skip, and was over 8 minutes faster than Singe's run, but unfortunately, no footage of it seems to exist anymore. On June 21st, 2013, Beta was able to bring the record down even further with a 54.45, a nearly 2 minute improvement, and once again successfully utilizing both Mountain Skip and Warp Skip. Warp Skip took several attempts, with Beta spending a minute and a half trying to body slam onto the end to reach the top of the lab, but he eventually was able to get it. He then proceeded to Ant Agony, where he showed off some new optimizations, namely using ledges high up on the side of the walls of the level to bypass several of the puzzles and forced mob fights in one room midway through the level. Shortly after, a runner named Back lowered the record by two more minutes with a time of 52.24, but this run is lost of time as well, with no known footage of it still existing. A few months later, on August 31st, 2013, a runner named Skycrash discovered a big skip in the Academy of Evil. The beginning plays out identically to the original Boiler Room Doom skip, with the player triggering the checkpoint at the top of the hub and then backtracking into the arena where you fight Madame Amberly. However, instead of death abusing, you jump around the fight trigger and travel to the other side of the arena, the side that you usually enter from after finishing Rooftop Rampage. You then body slam onto the doorframe to go out of bounds, and use a long jump to go around a cutscene trigger that will crash the game if activated now. You then walk onto the doorframe on the other side to load in the end of Rooftop Rampage. This allows the cutscene to work properly, so by walking back into the cutscene trigger, the player is then placed in control of Cortex at the end of the level. This allows you to do the fight with Madame Amberly as normal, and because defeating her is the only requirement for leaving the Academy of Evil, this allows runners to skip not only Boiler Room Doom, but also Classroom Chaos and Rooftop Rampage. Two more levels were now cut from the run, and now the only part of the Academy of Evil that was required to be done was the boss fight with Madame Amberly. Beta was the first runner to get a new record with this skip, achieving a time of 46.43 on the same day that the Academy of Evil skip was discovered, shaving nearly 6 minutes off of Back's record. The very next day, however, on September 1st, 2013, 
Back responded with a colossal improvement of his own, setting a record of 40.29, a staggering 12 minutes faster than his previous run and over 6 minutes faster than Beta's record. Yes, I did it. 40.29, new fucking record. Yes. yes. Oh my god, I got it, finally. Three months later, on December 1st, 2013, a Russian speedrunner named Smartkin took another minute and a half off of the record with a time of 39 minutes flat. The turn of the year saw more improvements to the record thanks to a Finnish speedrunner named Pol. On January 3rd, 2014, he achieved a time of 37.55, a 1 minute and 5 second improvement over Smartkin's record. Less than a month later, on January 28th, Pol improved this time further with a 37.43. Things were pretty calm for a short while after that, but on March 18th, 2014, Beta discovered something pretty incredible, and it has to be seen to be believed. So, when I said Twin Sanity is very unfinished, I meant very unfinished. A lot of concepts and ideas never made it anywhere close to being implemented into the game proper, but some did and had to be dummied out at the last second. One such concept was Cortex's hoverboard, which was intended to be written on in a cut segment from the game. The idea got at least as far as having the hoverboard be a controllable object, and because Cortex uses it in the first boss fight, it was placed out of bounds in the arena and made invisible. That's right, what Beta landed on that allowed him to fly around all of Insanity Island was Cortex's invisible hoverboard, fully controllable. Or, I guess I should say it was mostly controllable. The hoverboard really doesn't handle well at all. For the most part, all you can do is elevate it with any of the shoulder buttons and also use the analog stick to hopefully guide it as it endlessly moves forward. This is very evident by how wildly Beta moves around in some parts of his tutorial video. Regardless of its difficulty, the newly christened Hover Skip was big because it allowed the player to access the end of Insanity Island without going through Cavern Catastrophe. Clearing Jungle Bungle was still necessary because the arena for the first boss fight is located at the end of it, but even then, Hover Skip cut that fight out entirely as well as all of the level that followed it. Difficult as it was, Hover Skip saved a lot of time, and runners would certainly make use of it. Shortly after Hoverskip's discovery, Pol set a new record with a time of 32.54, a nearly 5 minute improvement over his previous run. This run, much like many before it, is lost to time, with no known footage of it surviving. On April 1st, 2014, Pol improved the record with a time of 32.27. Also, like, oh, I'm gonna test new strats here so get hyped. Okay, here we go. Okay, oh shit, it worked! Yes, beautiful! Beautiful! <laughs> I love that trip. I love that strat so much. It's too good. The events of the year following Pol's run are a bit shrouded in mystery, but what is known is that this period marked the entry of a runner whose name would become quite famous in the Twin Sanity speedrunning community. Another runner hailing from Finland, his name was Jerry. Jerry is a bit of a legend. When discussions about the greatest Twin Sanity speedrunner of all time pop up, his name is almost certain to be mentioned. However, all of Jerry's VODs got deleted from both his Twitch and his YouTube several years ago, and he didn't back any of them up, so all of his runs are now lost. But for those who saw him in action, or remember watching the videos before they disappeared, they all could attest to the same thing. Jerry was something else. Jerry's first record was set sometime between Poles 3227 and May 29th of the following year. Because no video of it exists anymore, the only thing that's known is the final time. 31.44, almost one minute faster than Paul's run. 
In the time since Hover Skip's discovery alone, six minutes had come off of the record. But while Hover would have a lasting presence in the game's other categories, its time in the Any% speedrun would turn out to be rather short-lived. In September of 2015, a runner named G-Pro discovered a new skip. Are you confused? I'd be surprised if you weren't. This giant fountain is present on the part of Insanity Island where the player begins the game, and in normal gameplay serves no practical use. However, through a combination of long jumps, air walks, and standing on invisible scenery, Gpro was able to use this fountain to cross to the cliffside across the water, where a tunnel connects to the other side of the island outside of Totem Hokum. The same tunnel that's intended to allow you to backtrack from Cavern Catastrophe. With this new fountain skip, you could now clear the entirety of Insanity Island from the very start of the game, without having to enter any of the levels in the hub. Jungle Bungle, and by extension, Hover Skip, was now gone. Quinsanity's speedrun had evolved a huge amount over the years. What initially started as a run where you did 9 of the game's 12 levels had now reached the point where you only did 2 of them. You still had to visit all 4 hubs to progress the game, but Insanity Island and Academy of Evil both had all of their levels skipped, and Iceberg Lab and Twinsanity Island only had their last levels done. For all the innovations that had been brought to the run, however, this was also the point where it started to become pretty frustrating. Mountain Skip and Warp Skip were already fairly difficult tricks, but Fountain Skip was on a whole other level. Even to this day, it is infamous for being one of the most grueling, miserable skips to pull off, and the number of runners who have successfully done it can be counted on one hand. This didn't stop Jerry, however. On October 6, 2015, he achieved a new world record with a time of 30.19. The first sub-30 minute time would be achieved two weeks later on October 18th by the Red Hot BR, with a time of 29.55. This record stood for almost a year until Jerry finally struck back with his own sub-30, setting a new record of 29.23 on September 25th, 2016. On October 21st, 2016, Jerry achieved what is now regarded as a legendary run. The full video, like his other runs, is lost to time, but unlike the others, small snippets of it still exist in the form of Twitch clips, and those who were fortunate enough to watch it before it was deleted can fully attest, this run was nothing short of perfect. Let's go!
2747. Jerry had shaved almost two minutes off of his previous record in a run that, at the time, was considered basically unbeatable. After Jerry's run, Twinsanity Any% went through a dark age of almost complete dormancy. The game had developed a reputation within the Crash speedrunning community for being extremely difficult to learn, and the select few who tried more often than not opted to learn 100% instead. Even though that category was considered overall more difficult, Fountain Skip alone deterred any new runners from even daring to try Any%. Another category that some runners took interest in was all levels, which was largely seen as the most beginner-friendly category, lacking much of what made both Any% and 100% so daunting to get into. Jerry's record was also just considered so optimized that attempting to improve on it was seen as a fruitless endeavor. During this time, a lot of pipe dream ideas for how to remove Fountain Skip from the run came into fruition, but nothing ever came from these ideas, and it seemed like to insanity any percent was doomed to stay dead for the rest of time. On August 5th, 2018, the Dark Age finally came to an end thanks to a discovery by a runner named Bandycraft. After almost two years of being tormented by Fountain Skip, the community was saved by... an acorn. Let me explain. The world of Crash Twin Sanity is divided into different chunks that only get loaded in when the player crosses a specific loading zone. The game also features various movable objects that Crash can push around for the sake of solving puzzles, and if one of these objects is placed directly in between the loading zone of two chunks, peculiar things can happen, such as, say, sending you very far forward when you jump on top of it. At the very beginning of the game, there's this large cliff that happens to house the loading trigger between two chunks of Insanity Island, and on the other side of that cliff is the connecting tunnel that takes you to the other half of the island. Also at the beginning of the game is a movable object, this giant nut. You're supposed to roll the nut into a hole in the ground to spawn a tree for... no meaningful reason. But instead of doing that, Bandycraft rolled the nut up the cliff, placed it between the loading zone of the two chunks, jumped on it, and was immediately sent to the cave on the other side of the water. And thus, the nut skip was born. It would not be an understatement in the slightest to say that nut skip literally saved any percent. Not only was it significantly easier than fountain skip, it was also faster, so there was no reason not to go for it. Soon after, four more runners achieved sub-30 minute times. Former record holders Smartkin and Pole, as well as Capradog, a relatively new runner who had begun running any percent without Fountain Skip during the Dark Age, and Joester98. Well known for being the world record holder for Pac-Man World, he had also been running Twin Sanity's 100% category since 2017. Prior to the discovery of Nut Skip, only two runners had ever achieved a sub-30 time, a testament to how much of a barrier Fountain Skip was for everybody else. But even with this large influx of runners coming into the category, no new records were set. Jerry's run was just that good. It seemed that to topple a run as legendary as his, something new would have to be found, and it seemed like the perfect time. More runners and more activity meant more people actively looking for new skips. Throughout Twin Sanity's life as a speedrun, runners had almost no problem figuring out ways to skip all of the levels, with the only levels still being done in the Any% percent run being High Seas Hijinks and Antagony. But the hub worlds themselves had proven to be a bit of a roadblock. For as many levels that they could skip, the runners were ultimately at the mercy of the unlock requirements for each hub. Getting to Iceberg Lab from Insanity Island was easy enough because there was no actual requirement to unlock the boat that took you there. It's just always present, so if you can simply reach it, you can go to Iceberg Lab with no other requirements, something that runners had been doing for quite a while at this point. But the remaining two hubs were a bigger problem. Twinsanity Island could only be unlocked by clearing Academy of Evil, which required you to beat Madame Amberly, and Academy of Evil itself could also only be unlocked by beating High Seas Hijinks. The platforms that allow you to reach Cortex's blimp and travel to the Academy won't spawn unless you play the cutscene inside the lab that occurs after beating Entropy. If there was a way to bypass the unlock requirements for even one of these hubs, it would save a huge amount of time. It seemed far-fetched, but the scene was more active than ever, and it was the perfect time for Twinsanity to once again be broken wide open. With several runners now actively looking for any way to bypass these hub requirements, the most chaotic age of Crash Twinsanity speedrunning was about to begin. Of the two later hubs, Twinsanity Island was being explored more in hopes of finding a way into it early. 
not only because it would save much more time to immediately access that compared to Academy of Evil, but also because it seemed like the more feasible of the two. Finding a way to make it over the gap to Cortex's blimp without clearing high seas hijinks, quite frankly, didn't seem realistic. However, there were some factors that suggested a way to get into Twin Sanity Island early might be possible. The chunk for the Twin Sanity Island version of the lab, as it turns out, is always present, and can be accessed by going out of bounds in the entry tunnel that takes you to the Psychotron. The problem, however, is that even if the game changes the player's location to be in Twin Sanity Island, you can't actually progress any further. You get placed at the bottom of the lab, far below the floor and out of bounds, and there's no way to get out. A way needed to be found to get inbounds in the Twin Sanity Island version of the lab. On September 1st, 2018, G-Pro shared a proof of concept that a skip into Twin Sanity Island was theoretically possible. Before the player first enters the room with the Psychotron, a cutscene plays where Cortex explains the purpose of the machine. At the start of this cutscene, Crash is programmed to walk to a specific spot in the hallway, but the player can use Cortex from the upper area of the lab as an obstacle to block Crash from reaching his programmed destination. The player regains control of Crash just a few frames before the cutscene fully ends, and if in this short window they're able to reach the spot where Crash is supposed to stand in the cutscene, the game will remain in a state where it will try to put Crash wherever he's programmed to be in a cutscene. From there, if the player goes out of bounds to hit the chunk for Twin Sanity Island's version of the lab, the game will put Crash in the location he's supposed to be for the cutscene at the start of the final hub, completely in bounds and thus skipping straight into Twin Sanity Island from Iceberg Lab. The problem, however, was getting Cortex into the spot he needed to be for this to work. The trigger for the cutscene at the Psychotron is very big and encompasses the entire width of the hallway. The reason this was a proof of concept is because G-Pro pulled it off using cheats that would stop the cutscene from activating, but without cheats there wasn't a way to get Cortex into the proper position without triggering the cutscene. The cutscene trigger could be dodged by jumping over it out of bounds, but Cortex himself couldn't be put in the correct spot in bounds if this was done. The community was extremely close to finding a way to get into Twin Sanity Island early. Getting Cortex into the proper spot was the only piece of the puzzle still missing, and G-Pro, Bandicraft, and a few other runners worked vigorously to find a way to achieve that missing piece. One week later, on September 8th, a breakthrough occurred. Bandicraft discovered that by carrying Cortex out of bounds and throwing him into a specific location, he would fall through the ceiling when he attempted to return the crash, putting him in the spot he needed to be past the cutscene trigger. All that needed to be done now was for it to be tested on a console with no cheats to prove that it worked, and Joster was the one up for the task. Okay, full control again. Nice. Not screw this up again. So I'm like straight out from here. It works. I got it. It works. It's real. Oh, so nice. It's real. Oh my god. That's it. <laughs> That's it. It's up three skip. <laughs> it works. Congrats. Congrats, dude. Yes. So time to figure out if it's safe. Time. Yeah, that's it. Thanks to the efforts of several runners, Dimension Skip was born, and the Academy of Evil was no more. This skip caused a bigger shakeup to the run than anything before it, far beyond simply taking a portion of the game out. The entire any percent route had changed dramatically. With the Academy of Evil no longer being required to access Twin Sanity Island, High Seas Hijinks was now no longer required to be beaten either. This meant the Mountain Skip no longer needed to be done. However, the Dimension Skip taking place at the top of the Iceberg Lab now meant Ice Climb needed to be completed again, bringing it back into the run for the first time in six years. Dimension Skip forcing the cutscene at the start of Twin Sanity Island to play also meant that Cortex left the room before he could be grabbed, meaning Warp Skip was no longer possible either. This meant that Rock Slide Rumble and the old Bandicoot Pursuit skip were back in the run as well. 
Even with Ice Climb and Rock Slide Rumble being re-added into the run, cutting out High Seas Hijinks and Academy of Evil saved so much time that the new route was estimated to be at least 5 minutes faster than the old route. Overnight, Crash Twin Sanity Any% percent saw a massive explosion in activity as everybody made a mad dash for the world record. September 9th, 2018 would come to be known as the craziest day ever. In a span of just over 25 hours, the world record fell six times. The insanity didn't stop here, because the next day, G-Pro discovered a way to completely skip Ice Climb. This required taking Cortex from the farm on Insanity Island and carrying him over to Iceberg Lab. The player then had to position Cortex so that he was standing right before the loading zone between Iceberg Lab and Ice Climb. By spinning Cortex right as you cross into Ice Climb, he'll be attached to you in Ice Climb while physically being located in Iceberg Lab. If the player then throws Cortex, the in-game coordinates of wherever he would land in Ice Climb will instead be applied to the coordinates of Iceberg Lab. Think of each area of the game as a grid with an X, Y, and Z axis, but what each area considers to be the origin to be vastly different. G-Pro was able to throw Cortex onto the coordinates in Ice Climb that match the coordinates of one of the checkpoints at the top of the Iceberg Lab. This activates the checkpoint at the top of the lab and deactivates the one in Ice Climb. When Cortex attempts to return the crash, he'll die, forcing a respawn. This will place the player at the checkpoint at the top of the lab. Skipping all of Ice Climb saved several more minutes, and over the next few days, the world record continued to fall at a rapid pace. In just one week, the world record fell a grand total of 13 times, and a staggering 11 minutes had been taken off of Jerry's long-standing record. The landscape of Crash Twin Sanity Any% percent had changed completely, and there was still more yet to come. With Ice Climb having quickly been re-phased out of the run, the community was eager to find a new way to skip Rock Slide Rumble as well. Warp Skip was technically possible without using Cortex, but the method for this was extremely difficult and not considered viable for runs. However, on September 17th, a new face entered the scene, a runner named Noah Simcox, who would spend a lot of time practicing Cortexless Warp Skip, hoping to find a way to make it viable. He didn't seem to be making a lot of progress on that front though, even while gradually improving his time. All of Noah's personal bests in this time frame still included a Rock Slide Rumble in the run, Cortexless Warp Skip just didn't seem feasible. And that's still true, as of the recording of this video. However, that doesn't mean there was no solution to skipping Rock Slide Rumble. On November 17th, 2018, Bandycraft found a way to make Cortex respawn inside the lab after Dimension Skip. The way to do this was by walking outside of the lab, and then walking back inside. Yeah. With this, Warp Skip was now back in the run, and Rock Slide Rumble was once again skipped. The Twinsanity Any% speedrun had now been reduced to a single level, Antagony. Another mad dash to lower the record ensued, with the Red Hot BR leading the pack.
With the world record now under 15 minutes, Twinsanity Any% went through another long drought. The category had once again reached a state that many runners found undesirable. Dimension Skip was so precise that it almost felt random whether or not a runner would successfully get it. Warp Skip already had notoriety as a difficult trick, and its reintroduction once again meant that Ant Agony had to be completed without dying. Any% percent was now a run that required a large amount of precision and even a bit of luck to be successful in, and while the record could still go down, most looked at Red Hot's 1419 and felt like that was good enough, and no one really tried to contest it. Eventually, however, Noah finally returned to finish what he'd started. Throughout the later half of 2019, he would make sporadic improvements to his time, and by the start of 2020, he was in full force, aiming to push for a 13-minute run. On February 10th, 2020, Noah set a new record of 1415, four seconds faster than the previous record, but still not quite the sub-14 he was looking for. On February 29th, however, Noah set out on another run. There was a bit of a movement flub at the very beginning, but Noah managed a very fast nut skip with little issue. After talking to Farmer Ernest to collect Cortex, he proceeded to Iceberg Lab. By this point, a way to skip the opening cutscene of this hub had been found, and while it is a bit precise, Noah pulled it off with no issue. Both Ice Climb Skip and Dimension Skip went cleanly, but Warp Skip took two attempts to successfully execute. The first half of Antagony went well, but unfortunately, this fire-breathing ant got in Noah's way, hitting him and costing him a cycle on the color platforms right after, losing him several seconds. A saving grace came in the Crystal Room, however, when Noah got what's known as the Ball Glitch. If the game lags on the same frame that an Energon Sphere begins to enter its socket to open a door, the animation won't play and the ball will remain on the ground, despite the door still opening. You can then forcibly despawn the ball and have it be active even with the puzzle completed. This can be done with any of the ball puzzles in Ant Agony, but this specific door is the only one where the glitch is useful, because the following room has two ball puzzles to solve, so the ball glitch allows you to bypass one completely, saving 6 seconds. Getting this glitch is essentially random because it relies on the console lagging, so Noah simply had a stroke of good luck in that moment. After jumping out of bounds to skip a cutscene at the end of the level, Noah proceeds to the final boss, and the rest is history. I'm gonna be just short of 13. I'm gonna be just... A little bit slower than 13. Oh my gosh! What the heck? That may have been a 13. That may have been a 13. I don't know. Fellow runner Atomical Sloss retimed the run to the frame and concluded that Noah's final time was 13.59. By the skin of his teeth and with a little bit of luck, he had achieved the sub-14 time, and so it stood for quite a while. But Noah eventually decided he wanted to push the game just a little bit more, and a year later he would lower the record four more times, first with a 13.51 on New Year's Day 2021, followed by a 1350 on May 18th, a 1346 on June 8th, and finally a 1340 on June 14th. Ah, let's get out of here! At this point, the question of what more could even be done to improve the run began to be asked. There were no more levels to skip, as the only one remaining was Antagony, and there was nothing past it to skip to since it housed the final boss. There was only one thing left that hadn't really been taken advantage of yet. Let's talk about version differences. For pretty much the entire history of Twin Sanity, the majority of runners played on the PAL, or European, PlayStation 2 version of the game. PS2s were easier to acquire, and the majority of the game's early runners were from Europe. The differences between the NTSC or North American version of the game and the PAL version were small, with the one major difference being the existence of a bug known as the slide glitch. If the game is running at 60 frames per second, there's a chance that Crash will suddenly change direction during a slide. This isn't completely random and is more of a nuisance than actively detrimental, but the PAL version of the game running at 50 frames per second made it so that the slide glitch just didn't happen at all. There were a handful of world records that were set on versions besides the PAL PS2 version, but by and large, that was most common. However, that does not mean that it was the most optimal. For a while at this point, it had been known that the Xbox version was actually quite a bit faster. For one, the Xbox versions of Twin Sanity are not region locked, meaning that either the NTSC or the PAL version could be played on a PAL region Xbox and run properly at 50 frames per second, making the slide glitch a non-issue. 
but most importantly, Xbox simply loaded the game much faster. Most of the loads into Insanity happen in the background during gameplay, but it is possible and quite common on PS2 to be forced to wait for a new area to load in, whereas Xbox basically never had to wait at all. Even the boat ride from Insanity Island to Iceberg Lab was much faster on Xbox than it was on PS2. It was estimated that the amount of time Xbox saved over PS2 in any percent could be as much as 20 seconds, which for a category that short, was a lot. Although Xbox had been known to be faster for a long time, PS2 was still competitive enough that no one really made a point to swap over to it. However, a shift began in about mid-2020, where runners gradually began making the switch. Some runners, such as Atomical Sloss, had always been running on Xbox in the first place, but the first runner to make a formal transition from PS2 was myself. However, I never took any percent that seriously, with almost all of my focus always being on 100%. Over the next few years, a handful of other runners would make the transition from PS2 to Xbox as well. Despite this, no one seemed willing to try and challenge Noah's run. Even with the estimated 20 seconds or so that Xbox saved, it just didn't seem worth it to many. Even with Xbox's growing usage among runners, PS2 continued to reign supreme, and another drought in activity ensued. Speedrunners are often asked, how on earth does anyone find these skips? And the answer is usually having a theory and meticulously testing a bunch of ideas until a breakthrough occurs. Sometimes though, the question has a different answer. By accident. On January 23rd, 2023, speedrunner Rijiku was practicing Ant Agony when something very strange happened. See this ant right here? Every once in a while, he can follow Crash in a way that causes him to break the checkpoint in this room. And in this particular instance, not only did the ant do just that, but Rijiku was just far enough away that she was in a separate chunk from the checkpoint when it happened. Not thinking much of it, Rijiku continued her practice and then death abused in order to return to the checkpoint and practice that part of the level again. However, upon respawning, Rijiku found herself in this room, far away from the checkpoint. The reason this happened is because Rijiku broke the checkpoint while she wasn't in the same chunk as it. Let's call the chunk that Rijiku was in chunk A, and the chunk that the checkpoint was in chunk B. By moving far enough away from chunk B to deload it, the checkpoint itself gets deloaded. So when the player dies, the game doesn't know where to respawn Crash. It will default to spawning him in an adjacent chunk, usually the latest one loaded in the game's memory. Every chunk contains data for objects such as platforms, Wumpa fruit, enemies, and Crash himself. So with no active checkpoint in the memory to spawn Crash at, the game will instead spawn him wherever his object location is. In simpler terms, this trick, which became known as the Cursed Warp, allowed a player to spawn in places that were not checkpoints, so long as they could break a checkpoint while in a separate chunk, and then move far away enough from the chunk that the checkpoint was in to deload it. Very cool, but not immediately useful. However, Cursed Warp was full of near limitless potential, and there were some hints that something might be in the works with some clever innovation. For one, once the Cursed Warp was established, it remained in effect until the game was reset, so you could do multiple of them in a row. If there was a way to use the Cursed Warp to get to the top of the Iceberg Lab, you could then go out of bounds to load in the chunk for the 10th Dimension Lab, in the same way that's done for Dimension Skip. With the 10th Dimension Lab being the last chunk loaded, dying and respawning would put you into Insanity Island, completely bypassing the need to do both Dimension Skip and Ice Climb Skip. Using Cursed Warp in this way would be revolutionary, but it had some roadblocks that required workarounds. Workarounds that would involve digging up some of the most ancient and obscure tricks that had been known for a long time, but were never useful at any point before. The first of these tricks was the Splash Teleport. First discovered in 2018 by Bandicraft, the Splash Teleport is a trick that takes advantage of the way Crash's drowning animation works. Whenever Crash touches water, a little splash animation plays, and whenever Crash drowns, the game actually teleports him to the coordinates of where that animation occurred. This ensures that no matter how deep the water is, Crash's drowning animation will always be visible at the surface. This also means that if the player is able to trigger a splash animation without drowning, and then drown in a location very far removed from where the splash occurred without triggering another one, Crash will be teleported back to the splash's coordinates as he drowns. At the beginning of Ice Climb, it's possible to set up a splash without drowning by body slamming this block of ice that bobs in and out of the water. From there, the player can manipulate one of the bats to start attacking Crash. Bats in Twin Sanity are pretty notorious for how relentless they are, and will follow Crash outside of the chunk in which they originated and even out of bounds. By luring this bat out of the Ice Climb chunk and back into the Iceberg Lab, if the player is able to hit the bat in a way that it will land on Ice Climb's checkpoint as it dies, the checkpoint will activate while the player is in Iceberg Lab, setting up the Cursed Warp. The player can then return to the outside of the lab and perform a body slam to trigger a drowning animation while also dodging the splash trigger. 
This will return Crash to the coordinates of the splash animation, but because the player is now in Iceberg Lab instead of Ice Climb, the game will apply those coordinates to the same ones in Iceberg Lab, which happen to lie in the chunk at the top of the lab, loading it in right before Crash dies. With the lab exterior chunk being the last one loaded in the game's memory, Crash will now respawn in the tunnel right before the Psychotron cutscene. All the player had to do now was go out of bounds to load in the 10th Dimension Lab and Death Abuse again, and they would respawn in Twin Sanity Island. There was only one problem with this idea, and that was setting up the Splash Teleport and getting the bat to follow Crash out of the cave while also not activating the checkpoint. The trigger for the checkpoint at the start of Ice Climb is huge and can't be avoided when entering the cave normally. In order to set up the Splash Teleport and the Cursed Warp without triggering the checkpoint, the player would have to enter Ice Climb out of bounds. A way to do this was found rather quickly that involved going up the outer wall of the mountain, walking along the top of the tunnel, falling into an area beneath the ground in the cave, and then using a body slam to clip back in bounds. This was all well and good, but there also needed to be a way to get back out, and this was where the second ancient trick, known as the Swag Crouch, came into play. While crawling, if the crouch button is released for exactly one frame and then pressed again, Crash remains in his crouching animation but is able to move around as if he was crawling. This strange quirk allows him to slide up a specific portion of the wall, and if positioned correctly, when damaged by the bat, Crash will go straight through it, allowing him to return to the top of the tunnel. From there, the bat will continue to follow Crash out of bounds and can promptly be spun into the checkpoint while the player quickly returns to the Iceberg Lab chunk. With this final piece now in place, the combination of strats now known as the Cursed Splash was born, and Crash Twin Sanity once again found itself broken wide open. On first glance, this skip might not seem like it saves much time, since it's simply another way to get to Twin Sanity Island early. However, the method in which it's done was significantly faster than Dimension Skip. Doing Ice Climb Skip required carrying Cortex from Insanity Island to Iceberg Lab, and the only way to do that was by talking to Farmer Ernest, which involved sitting through a 25 second long cutscene. Additionally, doing Dimension Skip required watching the 45 second long cutscene where Cortex introduces the Psychotron, as well as watching the cutscene at the start of Twin Sanity Island and walking out and back into the lab in order to respawn Cortex, all of which took another 45 seconds. So without even factoring in how long it takes to do Curse Splash compared to Ice Climb Skip and Dimension Skip, the former was saving 1 minute and 55 seconds solely off of the removal of 3 cutscenes. With such a colossal amount of new time save for a run already less than 14 minutes long, a third mad dash for the record ensued, this time with two runners leading the pack. Joester, who by this point had held the 100% record by a considerable margin, and Diochomp, a runner from Canada who had first made a name for himself in the all-levels category, but had eventually transitioned to any percent. Notably, both runners were running on different versions of the game. Joe was still on PAL PS2, having been one of the few runners that didn't switch to Xbox. Dio, however, was one of the runners that had made the switch, and became the first to challenge the record with the Xbox version of the game. While it seemed like Dio had a clear advantage due to Xbox's faster loads, the setup used for the Splash Teleport was found to only be consistent on PS2, whereas on Xbox it was apparently random whether or not it worked. This gave Joe a consistency edge that made up for the time loss, as he was able to get many more runs going than Dio, evening out the playing field. And with that, the race was on. Super quick neck kill. Boom! Let's go! That is what I'm talking about. Yes! Yes! Finally! The tie is broken. Through their combined efforts, Joe and Dio had managed to bring the world record below 12 minutes, but then, out of nowhere, Noah made a return. On March 7th, he brought the record down just a little further with a time of 11.51. Eleven days later, on March 18th, Noah set a massive new record of 11.36, a 15 second improvement and, when factoring in the time save that Cursed Splash provided, about on par with his 13.40 from two years prior. With the world record once again in a strong spot, the race to bring the time down ended. 
This was not the end of any percent story though. Midway through 2023, G-Pro made a return to the game. Deciding to take a closer look at setups for Cursed Splash, he found a much faster method on July 17th that worked consistently on both Xbox and PS2. After the player snipes the bat into the checkpoint to set up the warp, the player can walk back in the direction of Ice Climb while jumping over the loading trigger. This causes the player to still be in Iceberg Lab, with all of the objects for Ice Climb deloading as a result. From here, the player can jump to a lower area and simply slide off the ledge. If the player holds down the slide button, Crash will drown without triggering another splash animation, setting up the splash teleport. This is where the Xbox era truly began. Neither Joe nor Noah, the two remaining PS2 runners, chose to improve their times, and Noah's final time of 11.36 remains the fastest run done on the PS2 version of the game. But with this new, faster and consistent setup, Dio picked the category up once again, and on July 19th, he achieved a time of 11.32, just 4 seconds faster than Noah's time. Oh, you can see top right. Oh, then you can see I got world record by three seconds. One month later, G-Pro decided to enter the ring himself. By this point, he had already taken the records for both 100% and all levels in a dominant fashion, and he was looking to do the same with any percent. G-Pro was in the process of proving that he had what it took not just to be a prominent glitch hunter, but also to be the one who pushed Twin Sanity to its limit. On August 30th, 2023, G-Pro set a new record of 11 minutes and 25 seconds, 7 seconds faster than Dio's run. Dio responded two days later with a run of 11.19, the first runner to break the sub-11.20 barrier. The possibility of the game being beaten in less than 11 minutes was becoming very real with each passing day, and over the next few months, G-Pro went on an absolute tear. Under 11 minutes was a crazy good time, but for G-Pro, it wasn't enough. He continued to push further until Crash Twin Sanity was truly at its limit. Fuck off! Oh man! I got mecha glitched again! No! ever even faster than with the ball glitch so holy shit that was fucking a, that was insane as fuck <laughs> oh shit oh shit dude holy shit I got it oh shit oh man holy fuck Rico's gonna be pissed at me too, this is... From 1 hour, 4 minutes, and 39 seconds all the way back in 2012, to just over 10 and a half minutes in 2024. Over a decade of dedication, grinding, glitch hunting, and optimization culminated in a run that had reduced the game to the bare minimum. 
Quinsanity had been pushed so much farther than anyone thought was possible. So where does it go from here? G-Pro is currently trying to push the record under 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Beyond that, there really isn't much game left to cut down on. But Twinsanity has a habit of new crazy things popping up every once in a while. The potential the game has is near limitless, and it's always possible that something new will surface in the future. The history of Crash Twinsanity Any% is a deep and exciting one, but it doesn't even come close to being the game's whole story. There's another category with its own story to tell. But that is a story for another time. Thanks for watching. If you like the video and you want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel or joining my Patreon, and I'll see you all next time.